This is Salma Shimmel at ASCO 2011. Our discussion continues with key opinion leaders, physicians addressing various cancer types. And now we're going to get an update on what's been presented here at ASCO in the area of lung cancer with Dr. Ronald Blum, who is professor in the Department of Medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is in New York City. He is also the director of the Beth Israel Cancer Center in New York City. Hello, Dr. Blum. Hello there. How are we beginning to discover, and obviously through the identification of new pathways and proteins and all, the biologics, the, the molecular component of lung cancer is be, seems to re, be revealing more and more areas of, of, of the disease that we didn't understand before. What we've seen is a transformation really from, from just a cell as a simple a biochemical machine, and of course the molecular era, and I just actually came from a wonderful lecture by Dr. Weinberg on the hallmarks of cancer, who wrote a paper a decade ago which was transforming in many of our minds in terms of now beginning to describe why the cancer cell was different than a normal cell. And he gave a, an award lecture on, on what's happened in 10 years. And that in parallel with a talk that Dr. George Sledge gave, our uh, president uh, of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which for me was transforming in uh, beginning to understand that targeted therapy, which we all have a lot of excitement about, uh, has yielded some, some very important advances for people with cancer, including lung cancer. But what uh, is a bit of a wake-up call is a concept that Dr. Sledge coined, and I'm sure it, it, it has other uh, analogies, but there are smart cancers and there are dumb cancers. And these are very different. The reality is, unfortunately, that lung cancer is a very smart cancer. What is a smart cancer? All right. So let's talk about a dumb cancer first. So a dumb cancer is a cancer that is quite simple. And the example that he used, which is a very good example, is chronic myelogenous leukemia. So here's a disease where there's one chromosome, one mutated gene, and it turns out a drug that's highly effective, imatinib. And the reason we think it's highly effective is because it can target one gene, mm -hmm. can turn that gene off, and the probability is that there won't be a lot of additional mutations, so-called resistance doesn't emerge, and this drug imatinib has now been um, used for more than 10 years and has, uh, in fact, resulted in a complete reversal of, of the chromosomal abnormality and a long-term control of the disease. Uh, without a lot of uh, mutations and resistance. So that's a, a dumb cancer. Unfortunately, we have to go to a smart cancer. And, and there are many examples, um, and it turns out that lung cancer is one of the really smart cancers. Why? Why do we say that? Well, um, uh, for a number of reasons, but the scientific evidence is pretty overwhelming that the um, uh, characteristics of a smart cancer are that it has many, many mutations. Often these mutations uh, are induced, um, and smoking obviously is a considerable factor in this. Um, melanoma is another smart cancer where there's sun relationship. So in a smart cancer, um, it's not one gene, it's many genes. It's not one target uh, that we have to hit, but many targets. And uh, Dr. Sledge used the term uh, genetic chaos. Uh, and it really is chaotic and there's some very good papers that are uh, 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 in the literature and were very nicely referenced uh, by Dr. Sledge and some of them are presented here, showing that um, although we have some, some outstanding examples proof of principle, the reality is the genetics of lung cancer is very complicated and makes it a smart cancer. A decade ago we didn't have the cross-section of, uh, of treatments and we didn't really understand as nearly as much about the biology of this disease. So for you who has been practicing for such a long time, the perspective of the disease and, and, and how you used to treat and how you understand sure. lung cancer today is just profoundly different. So, so let's use um, lung cancer as an example. And, and certainly, um, I think most of us have familiarity with the notion of, of the target uh, of the so-called epidermal growth factor mm -hmm. and the uh, now clear uh, uh, use of a drug called erotinib. And what's happened, and in, in part this was a prelude to, to this meeting, was that ASCO now has specific recommendations that for people with adenocarcinoma of the lung, 
the evidence now is overwhelming that if a person overexpresses the epidermal growth factor, that drugs like erotinib are a better alternative than chemotherapy. And in fact, there's an inverse relationship. If you overexpress this particular gene, then this targeted drug works better than chemotherapy, gives longer survival. If you don't overexpress this, that turns out the chemotherapy is better. Would that mean that that patient would not have combination therapy, that would take a targeted therapy as a single agent? By combination, uh, the concept that we've used in other diseases is take a chemotherapy and add on a combination. Mm -hmm. The reality is that has not worked in lung cancer. There's evidence to the contrary that, in fact, there not only aren't additive, there may be sub-additive. So that it really is the, the concept that you have to define the character, the genetic character of the lung cancer in order to define your treatment. Could be chemo on one end, could be a targeted on the other end. Dr. Blum, when a, a cancer, a lung cancer patient is diagnosed, what are the various um, tests then that are conducted to begin to understand the molecular and genetic components and mutations for every individual because they're going to be different? So let me talk about a paper that was presented this morning, uh, and this was a consortium of cancer centers, and what they did is they uh, took about a thousand patients with, with lung cancer who hadn't been treated and put it all into a pool and tried to look at what so-called driver mutations they are. So there's this analogy or this metaphor, if you will, of the driver mutations, those the mutations that really drive the cancer, and their passenger mutations. So we now know that there are huge numbers of, of mutations in lung cancer. So if you compare lung cancer and normal tissue, mm -hmm. lots of mutations uh, it, by that comparison. And, but many of them are passenger mutations, have no real um, role in, if you will, driving the cancer. So what they did is they, they uh, found in a group of patients um, uh, driver mutations. And these are things that clearly are driving um, cancer cells. So one of them was the so-called KRAS, uh, which uh, at the moment we do not have a specific target, uh, targeted therapy for. Epidermal growth factor, uh, which we um, uh, clearly have a target for, part of that, but only occurs about 25% of patients. Then there's the other, the so-called ALK, uh, which is the uh, really a very good example of here is a, um, if you will, a, a mutation that was found, an assay that could be done in the laboratory was developed. It was targetable. Uh, there's a molecule that works against it, and a paper was presented uh, this morning showing long-term follow-up and a clear difference in uh, patients who are ALK positive, a relatively small percentage of patients, unfortunately, um, who got uh, a, a targeted drug and now are living uh, much longer and using even now two-year follow-up as a benchmark. When one is diagnosed, obviously, it's no longer enough to take their uh, tissue and put it under a microscope. You can say, all right, this patient has cancer, but you know nothing about it other than this patient has cancer. So a newly diagnosed patient, wherever they are in the country, would they automatically then be um, tested and uh, genetic profiling and um, analysis done to determine these mutations and characteristics before any treatment would be initiated? The answer is yes, and that really just shifted. Uh, ASCO, uh, just a few months ago, published um, uh, a paper, uh, and the term is, is provisional clinical opinion. So we have guidelines out there, uh, and guidelines are sometimes evidence-based with rigorous review of the evidence, uh, and some are consensus-based, and that is that you get a group of experts together and they say, yeah, the data is adequate enough to give an opinion. But this is a somewhat different idea, and this is a provisional clinical opinion, is that the, um, a rapid uh, decision made on an aggregate of data saying, look, patients should be tested. And the paper that was presented this morning showing, in fact, the yield from that, that you can come up with a subset of patients uh, who have driver mutations, um, and obviously the, the uh, mutations of interest are EGFR and the ALK, and for those patients, they need to get the targeted therapy. How costly is testing for these patients? 
I, I can't give you an exact number because it's being done by a number of people, but in the past, the kind, these kinds of testing have been, um, uh, if you do a, a, a cost analysis, and uh, actually just had occasion to review a paper uh, where um, in a population, they looked at the actual cost outcome, uh, and it, it's not been published, so I'm, 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 uh, it's confidential, but the concept was, was very clear, and that is, what are the comparative costs, example, of lung cancer, uh, and that was the example that was in this paper of testing, giving the um, targeted agent as opposed to not testing, giving conventional chemotherapy, and then blindly, and the outcome is, of course, it's cheaper to do the testing, A, because the testing is relative to the cost of the drug, not that expensive, and B, in terms of dollar cost, you're not using a drug that's expensive when you know it doesn't work, let alone the cost to the patient. So if one is diagnosed in the community setting, what happens to that patient's uh, tissue? Is it automatically then uh, sent out somewhere? I mean, can patients, the majority of cancer patients are treated yeah, in the nothing, community? Nothing is automatic. And, and it, I think in the last months, and there is a trickle, it takes a while for it right. to trickle down, but I think the message is clearly, if you have non-small cell lung cancer, the message to the doctor has to be, um, I understand there's some advances, and some value in testing my tumor uh, exactly. for its genetic properties. Which is what I was hoping we would, we would drive home. The patient needs to know about that, and I'll use uh, cancer.net as a website, uh, which is, uh, of course, the website of our professional organization, and that has very specific language that should give patients the background to ask that question. And this literally just changed in the last couple of months. As technology advances, the responsibility of the patient is growing in proportion to these advancements. And one would like to think that they can just go to the doctor and it'll all be done for them. But today, today's patient, as a medical consumer, must also be educated enough to understand the questions they have to ask and also to consider when is it appropriate to get a second opinion at an academic center where so many of the clinical trials and newer technologies are readily available. And it's a big burden for patients. There's a lot we have to learn to stay on top of our disease. Uh, of course, a, a well-informed patient is going to get better care. And, I th and there has to be acceptance of a level playing field. And uh, certainly the message to patients, if they don't feel that they're, they're being listened to or their questions aren't answered, it's time to, to ask the question. Uh, and what I, what, I, what I encourage, when I get calls, I want a second pay. I say, well, well, first of all, did you talk to the doctor and say, you know, I'm, you're not answering my questions. Um, uh, and more likely than not, the doctor will say, look, I'm sorry, maybe not this time, I don't have time, but let's set up another session. And if, the patient, if, if there's no movement there, then it's time to move on. But most of us physicians uh, are very respectful of, of the, the need for patients to have an understanding of what's going on and to be proactive in their care. I'm very struck about the speed at which things are changing in the area of lung cancer and also what it means to have a cancer where testing is imperative really before decisions about treatment can be made. It's unique. That doesn't apply to every single cancer. No, it's, it's become the generality in all fairness. Example for breast cancer, uh, whether or not a woman has estrogen receptor um, positive, whether or not uh, she's HER2 overexpressing, etc. I mean, and 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 for colon cancer, it's really become the norm. And and uh, there's a wonderful cartoon that Dr. Sledge showed of the uh, person uh, coming up to to the pharmacy window saying, "And here's my genetic type." Uh, and so increasingly, we need to know what the genotype is in order to write a prescription, in order to plan a treatment. And this is becoming the norm. It is moving very quickly. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, it's, it's the challenge. On the other hand, though, it's the real hope that the that, that treatment is becoming yes. much more uh, uh, effective for groups of patients that have specific genetic uh, characteristics. That's that the whole, the whole personal component, um, the personalized component. I'm just, you know, when I was first diagnosed, it was the microscope. And having survived as many years as I have, you know, the microscope will always be an amazing instrument, but now the molecular profiling it's, it's, it's the first and the step. genotyping, it's, 
now the microscope only complements, yeah. but it no longer is the basic way in which you can analyze a cancer. Well, it's the whole aggregate picture, and I think, example, you use adenocarcinoma of the lung, you characterize which cell type by looking under the microscope. But once you know it's an adenocarcinoma, then clearly uh, has to go for, for genetic testing as a way to figure out whether or not um, a standard drug like erlotinib would be of value. Are there any other areas uh, of interest or <clears throat> studies that we should be talking about at this ASCO meeting, or will we be waiting until we revisit with you at next ASCO? Yeah, you know, there, there's still fundamental questions. Uh, you know, are, are there uh, new targets? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's some very provocative data on, on heat shock proteins. Uh, there are other uh, targetable uh, mutations in lung cancer. These are early on. Um, the issue of uh, maintenance chemotherapy continues to be an important issue, and there was a study that was uh, presented again this morning uh, of uh, pemetrexate. I think it's an important study in that what they took is a group of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, non-squamous or so-called adenocarcinoma, chemotherapy, and then they were randomly allocated to best supportive care or best supportive care versus pemetrexate, and the pemetrexate group um, the statistic uh, that's going to be quoted is a 30 per, 36 percent Im improvement in so-called progression-free survival. So that sounds pretty good with a huge, really small p-value. Uh, so statistically important. The question then becomes, what's what's the real difference? And the real difference is 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 basically a little over a month uh, in terms of time to progression-free survival. And so uh, how to incorporate that at some increase in toxicity, uh, some um, increase in cost. Obviously, uh, the drug has, has cost either, depending on which system you're in, to the patient, uh, either as a copay or, or covered, uh, depending on that. So that um, uh, the difference is not that great. Um, but statistically, uh, it comes out that way. And it's a difficult discussion as to what the added benefit is, given the, the toxicity the cost, and although an improvement, we're still talking about a, a prolongation of progression-free survival to four months rather than two and a half months. The whole cost <clears throat> versus value just discussion. And, and, and this is really part of, of, increasingly has to be part of the conversation. Um, uh, co cost in terms of side effects, cost in terms of out-of-pocket, cost in terms of of, to the system, uh, so-called comparative effectiveness, um, and not just a knee-jerk uh, uh, conversation saying, well, this can increases your progression-free survival by, by almost 40 percent, I'm going to give it to you. It's, it's more complicated than that. And, and we wish it were better. And the quality of, of life. And, and we wish it were a, a, a better outcome, but it, it was a paper that was presented that, that uh, clearly uh, met its endpoint in the hypothesis that, that uh, Maintenance chemotherapy for this group is better than no maintenance. Is there any news for small cell lung cancer patients? Speaking of, of, of a really smart cancer, there's a really smart cancer, and this is a, a cancer that unfortunately uh, we haven't seen very many advances. And, uh, and the number of quote-unquote targetable um, uh, mutations have been small, but there's, uh, there, there are a lot of driver mutations in the small cell, and, and there are experiments ongoing. So far, no nothing that uh, uh, would have real impact at yeah, the Well, viewers level. have asked, you know, you always talk so much about non-small cell. Is there anything uh, for me? But is there active research happening in the small cell arena? The numbers are smaller. I mean, again, it's the, it's the market reality, uh, and it's a generalization that unusual tumors, unless they, they're dumb tumors, if you will, that, that, that you can have some high probability of, of great outcome. Uh, this is not the first area of, uh, of research. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Dr. Ronald Blum, professor in the Department of Medicine, Albert Einstein School of Medicine, College of Medicine, director of the Beth Israel Cancer Center in New York City. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Blum.